morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Grand Round today. Uh, before uh, we begin, I wanted to mention a few housekeeping items. We're going to be broadcasting live via live stream and YouTube. So uh, please use the microphone chair when you ask any questions and stand up uh, if and when you do so. Uh, the recording will always be available for viewing. And consider subscribing to the YouTube channel to get notifications when videos are added. Uh, for our viewers, if you'd like to submit a question, please text DeBakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, to 37607. You can also submit uh, via the live stream feed and find the video on livestream.com backslash hmh-edu. We have three more conferences scheduled for 2023 with the multimodality imaging for the clinician conference October 18th through 20th, open aortic training October 26th through 27th, and uh, transcranial Doppler imaging and vascular ultrasound masterclass on December 2nd. So today I count it my privilege and uh, got myself fortunate to be able to introduce Dr. Victor Pretorius as our grand round speaker today. He's uh, currently the professor of clinical surgery and surgical director of heart transplantation and mechanical circulatory, uh, circulatory support at the University of uh, California in San Diego. He originally hails from South Africa where he completed his medical school at the University of Pretoria in South Africa and he became a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada following uh, his residency at the University of Alberta in Canada. Following a dedicated year of training in pulmonary thromboendarectomy and right heart failure at UCSD, he became faculty and is currently a professor there. On a personal note, we met him as our team went to learn how to do pulmonary thromboendarectomies at the institution, and he was one of the most gracious and uh, kind surgeons I've ever met. He was in the operating room where I first saw him, and he's one of those surgeons where immediately you can tell this is a man who can operate. His surgical field was immaculate, clean, and he was open, kind, and, and gracious throughout the entire thing. Uh, he's always pushed the boundaries of what we can do in heart failure and mechanical support. Uh, everything from uh, talking to him about uh, bivad, their bivad experience, where he had one of the greatest experiences uh, in the nation there. Obviously, in pulmonary throm thromboendarterectomy, he's, he's constantly uh, uh, referred to as, as one of the, the leaders. When we first went uh, to UCSD, their heart uh, transplant program was, was transplanting anywhere from, I believe, like in the teens to the 20s in uh, number of hearts they did per year. They've seen dramatic growth where I believe, the, on, at least on per, per UNOS, the, uh, they transplanted 89 hearts last year. Massive growth with, with continued massive quality, staying at the top of the charts the, the entire time. Uh, it's something to be proud of and, and uh, we're honored to have you here to talk to us about how you've helped expand with uh, DCD as well. Please welcome Dr. Victor Pretorius to our institution. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eddie, for the kind introduction. And um, I remember um, meeting you uh, when you visited. And then uh, also uh, sometimes we cross paths on, on the procurements uh, when we do donor procurement. So um, always good to be amongst friends. And uh, Ryan uh, was a fellow with us and uh, trained um, in our program. And uh, it's beautiful to see how he's progressed and makes a contribution. So uh, today we're going to talk about uh, donation after circulatory death, and some people refer as cardiac death. Um, I think the official abbreviation is DCD, donation after circulatory death. And we're going to look a little bit at uh, surgical perspectives. Now, as Eddie already alluded, I hail from South Africa. And this is a picture of uh, our, my hometown, Pretoria. And uh, this is a statue of uh, a great man in our country, uh, Nelson Mandela. And uh, he's, uh, he's uh, basically seen as the father, founding father of, uh, of our nation, as it is seen today. And he has a couple of uh, very famous quotes. And the one I really like is uh, he, he used to say, it always seems impossible until it is done. And it seems as if there's something in the African soil that made people believe this. Um, if you look at him, what he has done, a long walk to freedom, seven years in jail before he became president uh, of the country and led the country in a very uh, unique and, uh, and uh, forward-thinking way. And it seems to have rubbed off on uh, multiple other people, including some of the entrepreneurs of our day, uh, with Elon Musk taking uh, um, on things and believing things can be done. 
way back when uh, Nelson Mandela was uh, actually placed in jail for the first time and he started his long walk to freedom, there was another big event that actually also happened and that was the first heart transplant in 1967. Uh, Christian Bernard did the first heart transplant in Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, the donor died from an auto versus pedestrian um, accident and suffered severe brain um, trauma. There was no diagnosis of brain death at that point in time, but they um, knew that the patient would not survive this uh, uh, trauma. So after discussions with the family, the donor was taken to the operating room where they performed withdrawal of care, so she was extubated. And they waited um, until there was uh, no heart activity anymore, and then they procured the heart. This established a very important uh, concept, a proof of concept that we can do heart transplants. We can move the heart from one um, person into a next person. Unfortunately, the recipient only survived 18 days, but it set the stage and uh, we were able to, uh, to learn a lot from there on. I recently visited the museum and uh, I found the original operative report. And when I started reading the operative report, a little bit more in detail, I, I was actually shocked um, to see what really happened there. You just hear of the first heart transplant, but actually way back then they already, um, they waited um, after withdrawal of care until there was no electrical activity, there was no breathing, there was no reflexes for seven minutes. And then they opened the chest and they actually cannulated the heart, the aorta and the atrium, and they went on to bypass. And uh, in those days, they uh, were only focused on this case, on the heart. So they basically turned the cannula to eventually just point to the heart and they clamped the aorta. So that was eventually just circulation inside to perfusion of the heart. And the heart was procured, brought over to the operating room next door where they performed the first heart transplant. Now, already establishing machine perfusion so early on was uh, very important. But I want us to focus a little bit on the, the images there. And uh, this is uh, three characters in the story, and it's in the story for, of today, and it's in the story of uh, almost every one of our cases that we do as, as transplant surgeons. We have the recipient, who was Luis Waskanski, and he was end stage heart failure, ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, suffering from uh, uh, severe swelling, uh, short of breath, uh, admitted to hospital on inotropes. Um, staring death in, in the face. And then we have uh, the donor, who was Denise Darval, who was a young female, uh, normal, bright, um, with full of life and the prime of her life, uh, cared for by the family, raised, and uh, now in her full potential. And uh, her life was ending at that point in time with full potential of most of her organs. Uh, there was so much potential locked up in those that, that can be extracted and we still have it every day. A lot of potential that um, we can make something good come from it um, and um, I think it's important that we keep these three characters and then the surgeon was uh, Christian Bernard who uh, was forward thinking, was motivated to, to help to see if he can relieve the suffering of, uh, of his patient and he, he used the tools that was available to him and he realized the potential locked up in the donor's uh, organs. But unfortunately, after this first heart transplant, transplant quickly disseminated and by 1971 there was uh, 166 heart transplants already performed. But this Life magazine reported um, that only 23 were still alive. So this is a procedure with an 85% mortality um, in the short term. So that's totally unacceptable and that quenched the enthusiasm for, uh, for heart transplant very significantly. And things slowed down. There were some groups that continued to work on the problems that was uh, evident with, uh, with heart transplant. And um, it was not until um, the late 1970s, early 80s, where uh, cyclosporin A came, uh, came to the forefront and it made a massive change in immunosuppression and grafts were surviving much longer. And this is the first report of cyclosporin A that was used um, for cardiac allograft. It um, was an experiment at Stanford under Dr. Shumway, performed by Dr. Stuart Jameson. 
um, who happens to also have grown up in the African soil um, in Rhodesia. And uh, he went on to become the chief of uh, cardiac surgery at UC San Diego. And he was my uh, first chair who, uh, who hired me on, gave me my first job. So I'm e ever grateful to him um, and also for the work that he has done um, in uh, transplantation. So this established uh, organ transplantation and it re has remained the gold standard for end-stage uh, organ failure. Now if we go a little bit into the history of uh, DCD, donation after circulatory death, which is also, which is also referred to as non-heart beating donors, um, we know that the first transplant was uh, such, we just saw that, but then in 1968 there was an ad hoc committee uh, Harvard Medical School, and they came up with a definition of brain death or permanent coma. And now we have a, a way of uh, procuring organs um, without the ischemic uh, event that happens at the time of DCD donation. And then that became the preferred way. And actually, for the most part, we all forgot about the, the possibility of utilizing DCD uh, organs. <coughs> um, there was also important events like in 1980, the National Conference uh, of Commissioners of Uniform State Laws came up with the Uniform Determination of Death Act, where they formalized and legalized brain death as well as DCD. Um, in the early 80s, we saw this uh, improvement in transplant outcomes with the cyclosporin event, um, and then uh, improvement in, and continued work on, on immunosuppression. But this resulted in an increase in demand for organs. And now we have another problem, and that's a wait list. So that uh, by 1993, there were already 30,000 people on the wait list waiting for organs to be transplanted. Now, this organ shortage didn't stop there, and it's continuing on. Uh, here's a report showing between 2007 and 2011 for the four solid organs here, what increase in the wait list uh, there was. And you can see for heart transplantation, there was a 36% increase in wait list. And uh, the U.S. Department of uh, Health and Human Services put out a report last year, and it showed that there was 113,000 people in the U.S. waiting on a transplant wait list. And we were only transplanting about 40,000 organs a year, um, leaving us with uh, far too many people still waiting and also dying on the wait list. Approximately 20 people die each day waiting for organ transplants. So we really have to work on increasing the donor pool. And it should be a multi-pronged uh, approach. Uh, the organ procurement organizations, transplant centers keep working on logistics, how to improve getting the organs and the recipients to each other. <coughs> And then also looking at uh, how to optimize even the marginal donors. How do we get the maximum potential out of the donor organs that are available? Um, when hep C donors um, became available, and we've seen this opioid epidemic increase the number of hep C donors, uh, we found a way of starting to use them, knowing that initially we were transmitting the hepatitis virus to the patients. And recent protocols have even demonstrated if you upfront treat that you never uh, develop a viremia in, uh, in the recipient. So uh, there was another increase in recipients uh, and donors for us. And then DCD, which we were going to visit a little bit more closely. COVID happened. We also learned how to transplant COVID positive patients. And then in the news recently, we saw Xeno heart transplantation and ongoing efforts at Xeno other organ transplants, especially kidneys, um, and we see that uh, there's uh, progressive uh, uh, survival duration of the xeno uh, transplants as well. Then there's also potential in chimeric and artificial organs, uh, which all should be worked on simultaneously. So there's a renewed interest in DCD, despite its complexities. <coughs> Um, if we look a little bit at the history, we know that in 1992 there was a Pittsburgh protocol which formalized DCD procurements, basically talked about how to set it up. Um, in 1995 there was a classification that came out, uh, out of Maastricht, and we're going to be focused on the Maastricht Category 3, which is a withdrawal, so it's a planned withdrawal of care. It's a very controlled environment where these patients die versus um, patients that arriving in the um, emergency room being resuscitated. 
Controversies and ethical dilemmas abound, and that's natural and important. We have to go through this process, as we had to go through the process of transplantation way back in the uh, uh, late 60s. Terms such as uh, ignorable form of cannibalism has been uh, leveled at uh, DCD donation. Um, but yet, if we inspect closely, the dead donor rule is still being complied to. Uh, the irreversibility, um, as well as uh, the intent, request for palliative um, treatment and no further resuscitation has to be kept in mind. There has to be clear separation between the treatment team, the care team for the donor, and the procurement team. And they should not overlap or mingle even with each other at the time so that there cannot be uh, any uh, conflict of interest. The rush nature and the time sensitive uh, sensitivity of uh, organ don uh, damage at the time of DCD due to its obligatory ischemia is uh, something that we need to manage and we need to learn and practice how to handle it and keep it as controlled as possible. The role of autonomy, justice, benefits, beneficence and uh, non-maleficence uh, need to be adhered to and in my opinion that is still the case. In 1997 there was uh, the Institute of Medicine came up with a report which came up with a suggestion of the five minute standoff period and that after that period it uh, is uh, irreversible and that we can proceed. There's unlikely to be uh, auto resuscitation. So um, I want to go a little bit towards normothermic regional perfusion, which is the in situ perfusion of organs. Has it been debated in the literature? Yes, and it's been debated widely. These are reports from Australia, from the UK, from Canada, and also from uh, the United States, all going through the process of in the public domain debating this. There are some publications that are against normothermic regional perfusion, such as this one from the American College of Physicians. But then there are also multiple other ones that are for it. And I think we need to continue to work on this, um, gathering more information, such as um, um, developing uh, proofs that there's no uh, reanimation, no perfusion of the brain, for instance. So the question, is the donor truly deceased after NRP has uh, been established, is, is a valid question. Um, and if we think a bit about it, on, uh, an individual is dead uh, who has sustained either irreversible cessation of circulatory or respiratory functions, or uh, irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. Circulatory death uh, declaration is confirmed uh, with cessation of circulation, and therefore there's also absence of uh, brain circulation and thus both circulatory and brain death is present at the time of uh, DCD donation. When the NRP procedure is performed and the head vessels are clamped and vented, uh, this ensures that there's absence of brain circulation and therefore the ongoing definition of brain uh, death can also be satisfied because you do not disturb the mis uh, with machine perfusion during thoracoabdominal perfusion, brain perfusion. And this was eloquently recently reported in the literature uh, during thoracoabdominal uh, procedure. This is a group from NYU that did transcranial Doppler flows. And here you can see their, uh, their uh, um, uh, report where they basically demonstrated before withdrawal and then at the time of withdrawal. And then after they've reestablished uh, normothermic thoracoabdominal reperfusion that there's no um, brain circulation by Doppler study. So given all of this, we know that um, the DCD donation is on the rise and people are realizing the potential and there's more and more DCD donors that are being worked up and families are putting forward more and more um, of their loved ones for DCD donation. Brain dead donation is leveled off a little bit, but the, the bulk of the increase in uh, donation comes from DCD. And if we look at, a, at our own region where I'm from, is region five, it's on the west coast, southwest. And you can see there's been gradual increase, but uh, a very clear tick up in 2023 that we've seen um, as there's more and more DCD donation happening. And uh, as we are getting better and better at resuscitating these organs, we perform more and more transplants. A very significant uh, rise um, in transplants happening. 
So we have a clinical problem or maybe an opportunity with uh, DCD. We've already talked about the obligatory and uh, ischemic uh, uh, event that happens, and this is for all organs, not just for the heart. The heart is very visual because you can see when it ceases its function, but the same happens for the, the liver and the kidneys, the bowel, all the other organs. Um, we do know that outcomes are largely similar now. We see it in trials and in, uh, in reports between brain dead and DCD. Uh, we do see an increase in utilization of devices such as intraortic balloon pump and ECMO post-transplant. Um, so there is room for optimization. Um, and there's also ongoing study needed to determine long-term. We've seen up five-year reports, but not beyond. Um, it's also a unique setting for scientific innovation. And uh, when I look at your institution with uh, the capabilities, uh, I would think that this would be fertile ground for you to, uh, to investigate, both in situ and ex situ, uh, research on uh, DCD donation. I want to look a little bit at the ischemic model that we know from coronary artery occlusions and coronary artery disease. And these are rat studies that's been well established. We know that if we occlude a coronary artery uh, for the first 20 minutes, you most probably can just unsnare, open up, and that you will regain function and, uh, and that there would not be very significant injury. But if you go beyond 20 minutes, you start getting the subendocardial ischemia and some of the dysfunctions, typically some of the dysrhythmias. Um, but as time goes by and you crosses over an hour, then you start getting mid-myocardium. And then over three hours, late presentation STEMI, you normally have transmural uh, injury. In a, in a, and if you think of this in a regional um, model such as this, now this is just DCD donation on a global. The whole heart is going through this process. But what happens uh, during the regional can be extrapolated and we can learn a lot during DCD. So if you occlude that coronary artery, the first thing you see is that the coronary sinus saturation immediately drops. And this is followed uh, shortly thereafter, within a minute, a decrease in LV contractility. And we find that there's an increase in left ventricular end diastolic pressure, and the LV systolic pressure uh, goes down and there's some EKG changes. And if the patient was uh, awake, he would have symptoms of chest pain typically. Myocardial perfusion and contraction are therefore coupled. So if you cut off the, con the perfusion, you end up losing contraction. If we then reperfuse, and it occurs quickly within several minutes, you can restore this uh, contraction, perfusion and contraction um, coupling that, that exists. If your reperfusion is delayed, you're going to have a uh, contractile function that remains depressed, but viable myocardium um, in the presence even of normal perfusion. When we see this, we call it stunning myocardium, stunned myocardium. And you can have a stunned global myocardium as well when you do DCD. Um, it's important to remember that stunned myocardium is still responsive to anotropic support, and that's why we often use it in, in uh, STEMI cases or in, uh, in uh, myocardial infarction cases. So if we look at the ischemia and DCD, we know we have the withdrawal. There's an agonal phase where the patient is basically going towards death. Then there's the cardiac arrest, typically the first declaration of death. There's a progressive variable ischemic injury. It depends a little bit on how much demand. Sometimes you see the blood pressures go really high. So there's a lot of uh, demand on the myocardium at that time of death during the DCD process. Um, and then eventually the, the function decreases and there's cessation of function. There's the standoff period, and it's typically the five minute standoff period. Then there's a second declaration of death, and then there's the opening up and uh, trying to get uh, either on bypass with uh, the normal thermic regional perfusion or with direct procurement, you're gonna try and get a cold flush in. Um, so there you have normal thermic distended global no flow ischemia. So you've, um, you've got to love the, the Spaniards, they do great work, and here's Suarez Camara reported um, what happens to DCD cardiac, in, or uh, to the heart. They found 16 non-cardiac donors, and they catheterized them before the withdrawal process, and they had biotomes sitting there, <coughs> and they performed endomyocardial biopsies, 
every two minutes as the agonal phase happened. So they uh, got really good uh, data for us that can inform us. So initially there's no deterioration in calcium hemostasis, homeostasis and mitochondrial function or cellular viability uh, at the time of circulatory arrest, which is kind of surprising. But then 10 minutes after circulatory arrest, they started seeing that there was uh, changes in the phosphorylation of cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase A, and they see the mitochondrial uh, function also decrease and uh, uh, caspase activity increased, so there's ongoing injury that they demonstrated. They also found that uh, once the, systolic, uh, the uh, mean blood pressure uh, goes down below 60, that there's typically a five and a half minute time towards circulatory arrest. And we see that in practice uh, very similar and consistent as well. Um, and this is consistent uh, even when there's long periods of it. It's a long time until the donor reaches this uh, systolic pressure of 60 and then uh, declines to death. So rapid restoration of uh, circulation is really important, especially if you think about the five-minute standoff period. You only have five minutes before you're going to see these damages uh, significantly happening. So it's important that you have a system that you can get on bypass very quickly or restore circulation. <clears throat> this is an arterial line waveform of a DCD rat model. I believe this was done at Stanford. <clears throat> And uh, here you can see that uh, there's a, a decrease in the contractile function. Just as we uh, have uh, demonstrated. And then there's a, a period uh, when you get to death where there's uh, basically asystole and there's no flow. Then you can see when you, when you cannulate, the pressure goes up because you, you're starting to flow the, with the ECMO circuit there. And then uh, after about uh, 20 minutes, there's actually systole and diastole and the heart basically has recovered function and you can wean off the ECMO at that point in time and it sustains the circulation. This was a rat model and this is uh, about 15-20 uh, years ago that this, this work was done. So we have a ischemic uh, preconditioning that we have to consider as well. As maybe DCD might be so good in the sense that uh, if you stress organs and you do ischemia and reperfusion. Ischemia and reperfusion almost primes the organ um, and uh, the tissues to, to tolerate the ischemic event that might follow. And uh, there's even models of remote uh, ischemic uh, conditioning. And if you think a little bit about it, if you ligate, say, femoral vessels or head vessels during DCD, you might even get signaling that might be protective. And that potentially could be some of the reasons why we see such good outcomes with uh, DCD organs as well. This is just a, gra uh, a, a picture to show how complex the mechanisms are and uh, for the, the researchers amongst us, uh, these are the areas where you can focus the research on to try and see if we can manipulate. And um, we've seen different uh, people come up with different ideas. There's a lot of uh, work done on, uh, on additives as well as on temperature manipulation in and around the time of DCD donation to see if you can optimize these uh, grafts. But this left us clinically with uh, two pathways, our traditional brain death pathway and then the new pathway for DCD heart donation. And the new pathway of DCD has two arms, the direct procurement and then ex situ perfusion or heart in the box. And then the normothermic regional perfusion where you cannulate, you perfuse inside of the body uh, with the head vessels clamped off. This can increase our donor pool. Initially the thoughts were maybe around 30%, now it's like 50%. In our own experience, and I'll show you a little bit later, we're around 55% uh, of DCD donors, so a significant increase. This can dramatically help with the shortage of organs and uh, decrease our waitlist times. So we saw clinically um, the UK, who has been pioneering DCD tra heart transplant, they reported in, 19, in 2017 uh, their outcomes at one year of their DCD donors, and they found it's equivalent to brain dead donor outcomes at one year. They then went on and, uh, in 2020 reported on the five-year outcomes, and this is now a bigger cohort, and excellent again, no difference between brain dead and DCD donors. 
They did report their two different techniques because they used both of those techniques, direct procurement and normothermic regional perfusion. And they found that the direct procurement uh, slightly lower uh, survival than the normothermic regional perfusion. This specific report uh, really motivated me to build a team that can uh, perform normothermic regional perfusion. And this was a report um, in 2022 um, just summarizing the worldwide uh, experience. And this was still early days. Like UK had 79, um, Australia had 49. Uh, there was another report from the UK that added 36. The US total um, experience at that time was around 127. Um, there was reports from NYU with eight cases, Vanderbilt with 15. And at that stage, uh, UCSD, we've already performed 74 and we used uh, both of the systems. And you can see that the acceptance rate initially wasn't that high, but it's grown and there's more and more um, graphs that are being accepted. Initially, the, and the early experience is fairly high uh, primary graph dysfunction rate, up as high as uh, 30% um, and uh, even 80% reported. But this has gradually decreased and we see now around 8%, which is not too different uh, than what we've seen in the past with brain dead donors and the one-year survival is excellent. So in the US, um, the resurgence for DCD was driven primarily initially by the Transmedics uh, USA DCD trial. Uh, NYU um, started with an NRP program and they could do it. This is in New York. They co-located the donors. So it's a very densely populated. They could move the donors. Um, we could not, we were too remote, and we're sitting on a little corner there with the ocean and the Mexican border as our, we, we had to move, we had to go look elsewhere for, uh, for organs. I found that uh, Vanderbilt was in a similar position and they came up with NRP mobile team. We discussed things a little bit and we copied um, a lot of what uh, Vanderbilt was doing. So if we just go over the two techniques, the direct procurement, um, if you look at this, uh, we already talked about the withdrawal, the agonal phase, the opening. Then there's a cold flush with a cardioplegia solution. Then there's a back table, typically in a bucket of ice, where you instrument and get this heart ready for placing onto the machine perfusion. Then you have the OCS cannulation and machine perfusion period. And this is also a time where you can travel and there's some perfusion to the heart. It's a Langendorf model, it's not perfect. There's no kidney, there's no liver, there's no ability for you to do major manipulations other than giving certain medications um, to the heart. And then you have another cold flush uh, when you take the heart out and uh, you're going to then start uh, sewing it in. So this is the system. It's uh, very advanced, it's made major um, improvements uh, um, for allowing us to do DCD. Um, it's very smartly um, designed. Uh, they have proprietary techniques and uh, solutions that they use um, to, uh, to uh, do the work uh, to transport these organs, to resuscitate them during the transport. This culminated in a trial that was registered and recently reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what we found was uh, that the um, DCD organs performed as well or maybe even fractionally better than brain dead control donors. And whether you looked at it per protocol or as intention to treat, this uh, non-inferiority was severe, uh, significantly, uh, statistically significantly present. If we look at the utilization, we see in the trial almost 90% of hearts that was placed on the, the OCS system was used. And you can actually see that uh, the, the unfavorable lactate trends was, uh, was the main indicator for turning um, this heart, these hearts down. So you use lactate for metabolic assessment of the heart on the machine to determine whether it's a, a viable and a transplantable organ. Just demonstrating the, um, the, uh, the, the outcomes uh, at up until two, uh, 24 months or so two years and uh, seeing that uh, DCD and, and brain dead is equivalent and maybe even DCD slightly better. So we've all seen this uh, already, hearts beating in a box. Uh, this was uh, just stunning a couple of years ago and now it's routine, it's FDA approved 
It's warm, it's oxygenated, there's active resuscitation, there's visual and metabolic assessment, and there's transport capabilities that improve logistics. There's been reports in the literature, and this is a report from uh, the Mass General, um, basically showing how uh, the outcomes are similar, uh, the wait list has been decreased, uh, the waiting times are shorter, but they have significant uh, graft dysfunction, and specifically in, uh, they demonstrate that at one week they have uh, significant RV dysfunction that's present still in the post-op phase. And this is to be expected. Uh, in an obligatory ischemic uh, uh, event. Um, this is uh, a, a Duke report, uh, also um, just informing us more of that this um, primary graft dysfunction in DCD is likely different than graft dysfunction that we see in brain dead donors. You can see there that the time on mechanical circulatory support, which is VADS, ECMO, and balloon pump, was significantly shorter in the DCD group than what it was in uh, the brain dead group, and that the survival of DCD primary graft um, patients were dramatically better than what it was um, for brain dead uh, and primary graft dysfunction uh, cases. So you have to set up a little bit and, and be ready and anticipate that there's going to be graft dysfunction that will be short lived, and uh, this ongoing resuscitation of that organ still in the, in the recipient. Now, if we look at normothermic regional perfusion, it's a little different. We, agonal and opening phase is the same, but immediately you have machine perfusion. Um, and then you have uh, an hour experience, machine perfusion for approximately an hour. Uh, then there's another cold flush and st static storage, cold static storage, and then we do the implant. And we have been six and a half hours on the cold static storage after doing normothermic regional perfusion, which is no different than what we would do for um, brain dead donors. This is the NYU report, and uh, they really set the stage for us in the United States, and in many things of transplantation, this group is, is driving things. They co-located, as I mentioned before, they had excellent outcomes, they had 100% utilization, they had 100% survival, and this uh, report so uh, really established that this is a technique that can be used. And Zachary Kahn, who was a uh, young surgeon at that time, was uh, kind enough to speak to us and uh, it motivated us. We did uh, feel that his, uh, his approach and like doing it in a study was excellent, but by that time it was not necessary anymore. We just approached our IRB, they looked at it and said, you don't need to do a study on this, this is an established practice. Our ethics uh, um, team met and, uh, and they also reviewed it and said it's, uh, they don't see unethical um, practice here and we can proceed with it. So we made a, a, a normothermic regional perfusion pump system uh, that looks like this is an open reservoir um, and, a, and a single uh, pump. Um, so a very torn down bypass circuit basically, making it possible to put it in a, in a plane and, and fly somewhere else. This is a, a short video of normothermic regional perfusion. And um, this is uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Mark Kearns. Um, and he's working with one of our abdominal surgeons um, who also loves normothermic regional perfusion because it improves the, um, the graft significantly and they can uh, use many more uh, livers and kidneys. Um, so this is, you can see the technique there, rapid sternotomy. You have to get into the pericardium. You can see the heart there. It's big, it's distended, it's non-beating. Um, you pull down on the aorta so that you can expose the head vessels. Um, I personally like to cannulate the right atrium now first, but in any case here, Dr. Kearns is clamping the head vessels. And uh, once the head vessels are clamped off, we're going to try and cannulate. First thing is the right atrium. We use a large bore cannula so that we can get good drainage. And um, you can see there, very distended heart, dark black blood coming out of the heart. This heart's not been beating for likely now close to 10 minutes. Um, then once we establish the, the connection there, we have to connect to the venous line. Typically we have uh, open reservoirs, so drain, uh, just gravity drainage is adequate, but we uh, do have a heart shell that you can put on top and you can add some vacuum if you want to do uh, more drainage even. Um, we're going to snare there to try and keep some hemostasis. Um, just putting a snare around the cannula. 
And now we've uh, got the heart decongested, the liver, the kidneys, they're all feeling better already. The pressure is off. We're going to cannulate the aorta here. This is really important. It's different to a normal cannulation. There's no pressure in this aorta. It's totally flaccid. You have to be careful. You can miscannulate. You can uh, end up in the adventitia. You can cause a dissection. So really important to do it right. There's no pressure, so blood's not going to come out. So you see the assistant squeezing the heart to get some blood into the cannula so that you can de-air the cannula. Then the connection is going to happen. We're going to fill up a little bit there, get air out, connect, and start bypassing. I don't know if anybody put a, 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 a stopwatch on, but this is two and a half minutes from skin incision and on bypass um, at this point in time. So very quickly that we can uh, establish this. We're going to now secure the cannulas. And uh, if you look, you'll see this is a minute later and the heart's beating. Um, this is uh, like when you see it in real life happening, it, it really is uh, still every time amazing. So what does NRP do to summarize it? It restores flow with oxygenated blood following death due to cardiac arrest. It reverses the warm ischemic injury of uh, um, thoracoabdominal organs during, uh, after circulatory death. And it increased the uh, organ donation by around 30 to 40 percent. It's also very cost effective. It's a really good bang for your buck. And this is what motivated my hospital to keep supporting this. Um, here you can see this is a, a pig model from uh, the Spanish group again. And you can see what the, what the organs look like after 30 minutes of circulatory arrest. And then if you give 30 minutes of perfusion, how well it uh, restores. We see kidney grafts uh, getting uh, uh, excellent outcomes. Uh, if you look at uh, just direct procurement versus uh, normothermic regional perfusion, and if you focus on the one-year serum creatinine, 1.5 in the normothermic regional perfusion group and 1.8 in the uh, direct procurement group. And the uh, nephrologist tells me this is typically equatable to a two-year additional survival of that graft if you at one year already have that kind of a difference. And we see it for uh, other organs as well. This is uh, the liver, normothermic regional perfusion. Uh, and it uh, looks at uh, survival uh, post-transplant, and you can see there's a significant uh, improvement for normothermic regional perfusion. So they resolve the, the issues with uh, bile duct ischemia and uh, acidosis uh, very quickly with, uh, if you can uh, just restore flow rapidly. We also see that the organ utilization has gone up, both for kidney, liver, uh, and pancreas. Uh, if you use uh, uh, normothermic regional perfusion. And this is data coming out of the UK, who has been also pioneering uh, abdominal uh, normothermic regional perfusion. Uh, so there's NRP increased kidney and pancreas utilization as well. Um, it's almost equivalent to the utilization of uh, brain dead uh, um, donors. So an excellent uh, uh, modality for improving the quality and the yield of uh, organs uh, from donors. The same here with uh, liver graft utilization and improvement. This is our own experience when we, after we started doing NRP, we, uh, we um, uh, pulled data from uh, all the other uh, centers that was uh, utilizing the livers uh, from uh, those donors. And we uh, actually got really encouraging uh, results back from them, and we recently published this uh, report just showing excellent uh, liver graft survival as well. So this is a, a map that you can pull up uh, in uh, UNOS, and it basically shows which centers are doing DCD heart transplant at this point in time. And then uh, you can see the, uh, the size and the darkness of the dot indicates how, uh, how big a program is and how many they've done. Um, you can see that Vanderbilt here in the middle of the country with a beautiful uh, radius around them is, uh, is not unexpectedly the, the biggest program. They had 111 uh, DCD uh, donor hearts. And then uh, second biggest uh, dot is uh, UC San Diego down in um, San Diego at the south, southern tip there. And um, we've done uh, 89 DCD um, hearts. 
Both of these programs are utilizing uh, normothermic regional perfusion as well as direct procurement. You can see Duke and Mass General are the two other um, East Coast uh, bigger dots and they uh, were exclusively doing uh, direct procurement. Um, this is what happened to our transplant program over a period of time and uh, I think Eddie came and visited us in 2014-15. That's when we were doing around 20 transplants and then you can see our steady progress. Uh, this year we are on track for going past 100 uh, transplants if we maintain the same tempo. Um, this is uh, how DCD has uh, happened in our program. Uh, in 2020 we started. In uh, 21, we had a significant uptick. 2022, we continued to grow. And 2023, um, this was a couple of months ago, we were growing as well. And then you can see our percent of DCDs. 2020 was 2.7%, 2021, 42%, 47%, 55% um, of our uh, donor organs are now DCDs. And we found that uh, we have excellent outcomes with this. You can just see our flow diagram of uh, how many donors we attend. Still a lot of hard work. There's sometimes where you go and you end up with a, what's called a dry run. Donor does not expire or does not progress to death and, and we come back um, without an organ to transplant. And we've been doing this kind of work and uh, I think it's important that we have to maximize all donor organs and not just the DCD. That's a actually a low hanging fruit but you need to work on all of these and you can see UCSD is an outlier um, acceptances with ejection fraction less than 60 percent acceptances over 40 years of age um, offers over number 50 um, offers further than 500 miles away um, so our program has been progressive and we do it as a combined uh, approach, um, both the surgery and the me medicine group really reviewing and asking us why not? Why not use these organs? Um, can we do it? Is there potential in these organs? As opposed to just, uh, is, this, is this a good match? No, we, we really look at each donor in, in a lot of detail. We involve our immunology people, we involve our ID people um, into the selection process as well. We review any missed opportunities. Like every week we go over all of the, uh, the offers that came in and look, have we missed anything? Have we said this is not good quality and somebody else took it as well? And then we ask, is this, is this appropriate? So this is a process that you need to uh, have in your program and it's helped us a lot. Yet you cannot um, give up on the quality so we have to we cannot just take risk on all the time our patients require of us to have good quality and this is our SRTR um, one-year survival data and our uh, three-year survival data and we continue to stay uh, out in the the lower bound which uh, is better um, and we are proud of this um, SRTR also rank programs on this uh, five bar um, ranking system uh, where they look at your um, waitlist time, your one year survival, and uh, getting transplant faster, so your transplant rate. And you can see that the two programs at the top, Vanderbilt is the biggest uh, program, and it's also the best program when you look at the bar chart. And the second biggest is uh, also UCSD. And these are two strong normothermic regional perfusion programs. And I think that it's uh, becoming more and more evident that that is actually uh, where the value lies, if you can get to the tissues early on and resolve the ischemic injury. We reported our, our transplant rate uh, and the, our effect on our waitlist time. And you can see that we have uh, ha we had a, um, since we started DCD, if we looked one year before and then one year after doing DCD, we, we increased our transplant rate by 87%. So uh, we've dramatically reduced our waitlist and increased our capacity for uh, taking patients onto our waitlist and, and helping them out. We also looked uh, in that same study, we uh, had enough data that we could look at what happens to the grafts. Um, and we looked at our uh, IVIS data and we found that there's no difference in graft vasculopathy and intimal thickness uh, between DCD and DBD donors at one year. 
We've also utilized more and more organs. This is a recipient that was the first patient to receive triple organ transplant from DCD donation. The donor actually yielded six organs for donation where we used normothermic regional perfusion and he received three of the, the six organs. Um, a young man with uh, amyloid and uh, his story is uh, recorded in the Journal of Science um, just basically talking about his experience, how he was facing death and then this opportunity. Um, for us to find three organs um, in our little region would have been really challenging. But since this case was done, we've done three more um, triple organ transplants, which we previously would not have been able to find these organs all in one go. Um, so this is now established for us. My administration is also very happy um, because we see that the moment we started doing DCD transplants, our 30-day um, hospital admission rate has come down and our length of stay has come down. So they think this is uh, also a, a good thing. Um, we are more efficient, um, producing uh, better quality of work. And this is my team, um, the cardiology team, uh, the close friends and uh, excellent uh, collaborators. Um, and then our two surgeons that are performing the majority of uh, these cases. And uh, this is our procurement team. Um, they are a jovial bunch that really work hard, fly all over the show. Um, they've developed skills that uh, are very unique and um, we've continued to invest into them, uh, train them, um, and they are uh, experts in what they do at this point in time. And this is our map of uh, where we've gone. And you can see that we come to your state frequently to pick up uh, DCD hearts. Um, and we hope to continue and we hope that uh, you would travel to our state as well so that we can maximize the potential that lies within donor organs. So um, this is the transplant volume in the US and you can see there's this uptick. We saw when the opioid epidemic, uh, C donors lifted the bar up a little bit and now it's DCD that's lifting it and it's going to, I think, tilt it even further up. You can see in the US uh, early experience still, I think these green bars is going to eventually fill up half of the, um, of the bar. Um, we're gonna do half of our transplants is gonna come from, uh, from DCD hearts. So don't be afraid of moving forward. The future is bright. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a whirlwind of inspiration for us. And um, I really want to congratulate you for uh, pushing this for not just your center, but for the nation and the world. And we can imagine the blood and sweat that goes into this. I know when, when you build a program, get to that level. So it, it, it's, a, it's something hopefully we can learn and, and continue to move the field forward uh, to the organ shortage. Uh, the, the two questions I have is one, um, of course, we started DCDs in Texas and, and, and Houston. We've had some of these ethical dilemmas with le legal issues with NRP. So NRP part, I think, is being revisited. Um, and when we do the OCS system, as you mentioned early on, the PGD becomes your Achilles seal and probably part of it is just the learning curve. So my question objectively is, I feel like you have to have a safety net of an early recognition of PGD and early initiation of MCS. And, and it's better now than 10 years ago in general in transplant field. But what objectivity do you have in making sure you're not overdoing like an ECMO for PGD upfront versus having a threshold where the pressure requirements are going up or if you go through the definition of PGD, it, you know, you have all this complicated vasopressor score. So are you using anything objective in the OR to say, we've reached this threshold, let's just salvage the heart put in an ECMO when you come off pump? Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, thank you for the comment. And uh, I, I agree with many of your remarks. Um, 
and uh, we, we still struggle with uh, that decision making as well. I think we've learned um, just with experience that um, if we um, see early graft dysfunction, we have a couple of things that we would do. I would spend maybe 45 minutes trying to resuscitate that uh, heart in the operating room with an open chest. If I don't see um, recovery in that period of time, I typically would uh, start with uh, support. Um, we have a graded way of how we do this. Um, I think one of the things that uh, maybe is a little bit unique and I need to gather proper science behind this, but um, if I see any graft dysfunction, I start a, a thyroid hormone infusion. Uh, the next is uh, that we would increase inotropes, um, typically add dual inotrope. Then we would put an intraortic balloon pump. And uh, if in 45 minutes um, I don't uh, see that the graft is, is uh, starting to recover with that kind of uh, support, we would go on to uh, leaving the cannulas centrally and just stay on ECMO. We switch over to ECMO, uh, reverse the anticoagulation, mop up, Backing, close the chest, go back to the ICU, carry on typically 24, 48 hours, and then uh, we can come back, open up, wash out, come off bypass. I've come, we've been able to come off bypass every time, uh, come off ECMO every time uh, that we've had a, a DCD, PGD case that went on to, that was so severe that we went on to uh, uh, ECMO. Yeah. So one of the other things is, um, and I talked a little bit with Eddie, like if I have to go with levofed up to 10, like I, I'm not going to do that because by that time I'm harming the kidney, I'm harming the gut, I might have bowel ischemia, I might have troubles that I don't want. So I just, uh, by that time I'm going to put ECMO on. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, that's like that either legislation is very good for us. My second question is, do you see utility in using Sherpa pack after NRP uh, procurement or are you just using the routine uh, is there any difference, or are you just doing the old school ice pack after an RP? Um, yeah, so there might be utility. Uh, I've seen the reports in the literature um, that is encouraging uh, for the Sherpa pack. Um, we have to look at value for money, um, and uh, in my own program, I'm trying to spend money on other things, so we have not used the Sherpa pack. But that being said, it's very important how you use static cold storage as well. Um, I think there is a point in the Sherpa pack that makes the point that you cannot freeze the hearts. Um, too cold is bad. So the way we package our, uh, our heart is uh, we do not put any ice close to it, actually. We have a little insulation uh, barrier um, between the ice and the, the cold solution that we put the heart in. Um, and uh, that's worked well for us. Um, I, I, it would be nice to, to use it more, but it costs money as well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Victor, for coming and for a great lecture. I have a question. When you uh, accept for the DCD uh, you know, donors, do you, how do you uh, consider recipient factor? And then specifically, I want a few comments on the adult congenital heart disease patient. I know you're programs growing and then we are looking to grow a program too. Have you done any uh, DCD on the adult congenital? That's one question. Second is generally as far as how you consider recipient factor as far as mm -hmm. the etiology or whatever when you accept the DCD donors. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, that's also been an evolving story for us, Ryan, because in the beginning we, uh, we were concerned and we did not want to uh, um, take higher risk recipients and put uh, DCD in. But then as time went by, we got more confident that these hearts are actually really good. So now for us, it's not a major uh, differentiator, um, whether it's a DCD or a DBD. Um, I think you have to maybe keep it in mind here and there occasionally, like what if you cannot uh, put a balloon pump in? I'm just going to give one example. I have a patient who Dr. Cooley did uh, uh, aorta to, um, uh, ascending aorta to descending aorta bypasses for um, somebody with coarctation. And it's like I cannot get a balloon pump into that uh, patient the, 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 the way that um, 
that uh, the aorta is, I, I cannot use a balloon pump. I'm thinking hard about putting a DCD in that one because I know that I might need a balloon pump, but I have to look for that one for even the brain dead donors that I put in. I cannot undersize, I cannot take a risk here. And that's for every donor, you have to really look at all the factors. But at the moment, we do not discriminate and say DCD is, is only for this or we cannot put that. Like We see it as equivalent grafts. Dr. Torius, thank you so much. Um, again, I echo Dr. Bimaraja's thoughts of you know, a lot of inspirational um, fodder for us. My question is a little bit more maybe you know, perspective-wise. Um, what do you feel like that we can do as a community to help move DCD forward? I feel like some of the recent um, controversies coming up of, as you said, the papers, and honestly, even the most recent UNOS paper the white paper that, you know, kind of, again, I think underlined the question of the dead donor rule and then said, you know, proceed, but proceed cautiously, which I've asked them, what does that mean? You know, um, but what do you think that we can do as a community to help, you know, um, reduce some of the controversy and maybe have um, public awareness and embracement of the technology that you pointed out that has such an amazing potential? Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, my perspective is that, uh, that we have to uh, basically have a multi-pronged approach. It has to come from different angles. I think uh, we have to do high quality work all the time. You cannot have uh, things go bad on uh, these procurements. Um, and we have to make sure that the outcomes are really good because that eventually drives it. We have to be fiscally responsible because that is a very important factor for our community, our society. So and how we manage it on a, on a financial basis is really important as well. We have to acknowledge there are sensitivities and different views and beliefs um, amongst people and we have to respect that. But we have to, I do agree, move forward cautiously. And cautiously to me means like you have to really put effort and attention to it. Um, and our program, myself and, and the other surgeon, goes on these procurements because we want to make sure this is the highest quality. We've trained people, and I only use that uh, group of people. We debrief after every case, um, go over what happened, what could be done better, so that we can improve the system. Um, so I think uh, society, um, organizations, need to come out um, with their uh, support, uh, guidelines, recommendations of how to do this. Um, I think uh, we need to have work groups that continue to work. I think on the research side, uh, we're starting to see more and more data about what happens to the brain. Is there any activity? Is there any flow? Uh, this kind of uh, information we need to continue to extract. We need to continue extract data from these cases as they happen. Uh, so a multi-pronged approach, um, and I think, I think that's what is entitled and uh, the cautiously move forward from the white paper, uh, which we saw, and, uh, and uh, I think it is for where we are now, it's appropriate how that white paper is worded and structured. Um, but I think we will, over time, as it was with heart transplant, uh, euphoria, down in the dumps, slowly crawling, working, gradually researching our way out of it until where we are now. And we have, like, this is amazing to see people 20 and 30 years after an organ transplant living a vibrant life. And I cannot, like, and I see it in my colleagues, um, like that emotion, it gives you goosebumps. When you see people that was faced with death, now see their children grow up and, uh, and live full lives. So, it's worthwhile endeavor. I think we need to not just shy back from, oh, this is maybe not uh, so easy to mentally even handle. I welcome anybody to come to the OR to come and see what we do. If, if we ever, in your region, I, I'm open to people wanting to come visit. I always, when people have negative comments about it, my first reaction is I want to invite you. Come and look, come and look for yourself. I can show you videos of what it looks like um, if you have any question, is, is the patient dead or not? Like, like the policeman on the corner of the street can tell you, yes, he's dead. Um, when the pupils are 
dilated, when it's white um, in the face, and there's no flow. Um, like it's, it's just, um, I think we need more time for this to uh, percolate through and we need to do it on a, um, a multi-pronged approach. Thank you. Arvind. Yeah.